Welcome to FAM Church Online. My name is Claire and I'm so glad that you're tuning in with us this morning. We would love to connect with you and if we haven't had the chance to do so yet, please text welcome to the number that appears here at the bottom of the screen. We'll send a digital connection card to your phone. You can fill that out and send it back to us and we'll send you a gift in the mail just for connecting with us. As always, we hope Pastor John's message really speaks to your heart this morning. And if you would love to connect with people in our community, you can do so down below in the comments. Hi everyone, this is Pastor John White, the lead pastor at Fam Church in Morgan, North Carolina. I'd like to take just a few moments of your time today to talk to you about excellence. Excellence is one of our core values here at Fam Church. There's a scripture verse that backs up this idea of excellence. It's found in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 23, and it says this, We do everything with our whole heart, not as if we're doing it unto a man, but as we're doing it unto the Lord. Every area of our life should be done in excellence, and that includes our giving. So here at Fam Church, there are four ways that you can give. You can give through our app. I encourage you to download our app. Go to the bottom of our app, look for the Give tab, click on it, and there'll be some instructions for you to give through our app. Or you can also text your amount to the telephone number that you see on the screen. If you've never given through our texting system, please be advised that there will be a link there for you to click to set that up for future gives. App, text, also our website. If you'll click in the description below, it'll take you to our website. At the top of our website on our home page, there's a list of tabs. Click on the Give tab and there'll be a system there to lead you through some steps to set that up. If none of these electronic means suits you, please be advised that you can also send your gift through snail mail. The address should be on the screen right now, 1955 U.S. Highway 70 East in Morganton, North Carolina. The zip code is 28655. Regardless if you use our website, our app, the text, or if you use snail mail, please hear my heart in this. If you will reach out to me, I promise you that I'll continue to reach out to the people of Morganton and the surrounding communities.
Well, good morning, fam church. I so hope that you're doing well. It's so good to see you again this week, even though, again, I'm coming to you through a screen. But hey, man, I miss you so much. Wasn't that a great song from our worship team? The glory belongs to the Lord. The glory is yours. And I'm here to tell you that we can testify that today, regardless if we're in our living rooms, bedrooms, wherever we may be today, we can testify and understand in our hearts that the glory belongs to Jesus and Him alone. Praise God. Nice job from our worship team. Well, again, I hope you're doing well. I hope that this video finds you well, you and your family. God bless you. I, I, once again, I do miss you, and I look forward to seeing you as soon as we possibly can. And, um, you know, as I sought the Lord this week, I wanted to um, bring something to you that I knew would be fresh and relevant and of God. And so as I sought the heart of the Lord, uh, this, is what, this is what I felt like God would want me to share uh, with our fan family and also those of you who are viewing in. And it's this. You know, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about repenting. We've been talking about getting out of this crooked and perverse generation. We've been talking about... Um, leaving all this stuff behind and getting right with God, that if there was ever a season where the Lord is trying to communicate things to us, that this is now. And so it finally dawned on me over the last couple of weeks that, you know what, there may be a lot of people who are viewing, uh, believers and unbelievers alike, and seekers, who may not know how to get right with God. It's never really dawned on them, never been taught to them. So I thought I'd take some time, some of your time today, and share with you, how do you get right with God? How, how, how does that work out? What's that look like? And well, as I began to study that and try to formulate something that I could give to you today, the Lord took me back to the Old Testament. So bear with me as I tell you a story from several thousand years ago. The story finds itself uh, around the time of King David. King David was, um, was a man's man. He also ruled over Israel about 1000 B.C. And um, if you read in the Old Testament, you'll know quite clearly in, that David was a man, oh, he was a man's man. He was not someone to be trifled with. He was a warrior. He knew how to get things done. He was a warrior king. And God used him mightily to defeat the armies of Israel. There were seasons when the king was supposed to go out to battle. For whatever reason, and the Bible doesn't tell us, David decided during the season when they would go out to war that he would stay home. And so one day when he got up, he got up on top of his home and he woke up and went up there and he began to survey the landscape and began to look over the city of David and lo and behold, he saw a woman bathing. And, uh, well, the Bible just is pretty clear that he liked what he saw. And he um, told his attendants that he would love to have this woman as his own. And so she was brought to him. Um, they had relationships with one another. And lo and behold, uh, she became pregnant. There was a problem though. This woman who David had picked out and had had relationships with was married. Her husband was a warrior. He fought for David. He fought for the armies of Israel. His name was Uriah. Uriah was an upright man. He was a good man. But for whatever reason, David decided that this woman would be his. Well, as is always the case, every decision that we make has a consequence. There was a consequence here. This girl's pregnant. Uh, David knows she's pregnant. David knows that this child is his. And so he sends word to Uriah, who's out on the battlefield, to come home. To come home. In David's mind, he's thinking, well, if I can get him home, 
then obviously he's been without his wife for a while. They'll have relationships. And once they have relationships, Uriah will think that this baby that's mine actually belongs to him. And so uh, David called for Uriah to come home. Uh, he was absolutely convinced, David was, he was absolutely convinced that Uriah would go home. But you know what happened? Uriah was just, he was a man of integrity. And he would not go home. He refused to go home. As a matter of fact, he slept at David's doorstep. He would not go home. And David knew then he was in a pickle. He said, I, I, I've, got, I've got a man here who's got more integrity than I've got. And so he sent him back out onto the battlefield. Well, because he could not manipulate Uriah to go home and to have relationships with his wife, David orchestrated another plan. This plan was even more devious. This plan was even more satanic. David gave instructions to his generals that... Uriah was to be put in the heat of battle. And when the battle was the most fierce, that the general was to uh, command a retreat and to leave Uriah in the middle of this heated battle so that he would die by the sword. It was a demonic plan. But David's generals followed through with what they had been given. And Uriah died. It was a terrible, terrible thing. And the Bible says that what David did that day displeased God. God is always watching. Never forget that, my neighbor. Never, never forget that. God is always watching. And what David did displeased God. And so... God spoke through a prophet by the name of Nathan. Nathan began uh, to understand what God wanted him to tell David. And so Nathan went to David's house, asked for an audience with the king, and was granted an audience with the king. Nathan came in and began to tell a story. He began to tell the story about a rich man and a poor man. And how the rich man had many sheep and many cows and was very, very wealthy. The poor man only had one ewe lamb. Only one. He raised that lamb up. He fed that lamb. It was almost a part of the family, really. Kids played with it. It was his lamb. He only had one. The rich man had plenty of lambs and plenty of cattle and plenty of sheep. Well, the rich man had a visitor. And it was time to eat. But instead of the rich man going into his own herds and slaying a sheep for supper, what did the rich man do? The rich man went to the poor man's house and took the poor man's lamb and slaughtered it and ate it. Well, when Nathan told David this story, David was incensed. He burned with anger. And he says, the man like that needs to die. Not only does he need to die, he needs to repay the poor man four times over what he's taken from him. David says, where's this man at? Bring him here before me. And Nathan the prophet took his finger and put it in David's face and said, you're the man. You're the man. You're the man who did this. You're the richest man in Israel. You could have had any woman you wanted. And yet this poor man over here, he had one wife. You could have had any woman you here you wanted, and yet you forsook all of them, and you went over here and you took this man's life so that you could have his wife. Well, I'm going to tell you what. That is a powerful word that come from the prophet to the king of Israel. Now, David was faced with a dilemma at that point. What do you do when you are face to face with your sin, what do you do? Well, you're, you have one or two um, ways that you can, you can do that. You can either say, God, I'm sorry, and you can repent. Or you can harden your heart and continue to do what you've always done. Now, as I 
told you David was a man of war. Killed people, multiple wives, had all this stuff going on that by today's standards you look and you say, good gracious, this guy was, well, it's not someone that you want to hold up to as a pillar of society. And yet the, de- the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. Why would the Bible call David a man who um, took women as his own, killed people, done all these kinds of things? Why would the Bible say that David was a man after God's own heart? And it's because of this. It's because of this story that took place with Bathsheba and Uriah and David. It's because when David was confronted with his sin, he repented. He had a soft place in his heart towards God. And so I asked you when this first started. How do you make things right with God? How do you make things right with God? Well, thankfully, out of this experience, David wrote a psalm that has been handed down to us that we can learn a lot from. When we are confronted with the fact that we are sinners too. And that we need to get right with God. Because I want to let everybody know who's watching today. You're the man. You're the woman. I'm the man. We are all guilty of sinfulness. And we need to repent before a holy God. And so David took pen to paper. And he fastened one of the most beautiful Beautifully written psalms that have ever been written. Psalm 51. And I would encourage you just to take your own time to check that out. But I'm just going to take just a few points from Psalm 51. To bring to your hearing today. And I think that there will be a blessing to you. What do you do? How do you get right with God? How do you get right with God? Well, the first thing that we can see in Psalm 51. Is in verse 1 is this. Be gracious to me. Be gracious to me. Friends and neighbors, let me tell you, God is a gracious God. But David's sin had so beseeched him that he thought God was going to be a a, a vengeful God and that maybe even God would kill him. And so David began the process of repenting by saying, God, be gracious to me. Friends and neighbors, let me tell you something. If you'll call out to God, he's gracious. He's gracious Listen, all of our lives are completely messed up. We are, we are a product of the fall, of the fall of humanity. But I'm here to declare to you today that God is able to be gracious to us. And so David called out to God in verse 1 and he said, be gracious to me. And then in verse 3, here's something else I'd like to point out to you. David says here, And we need to understand this clearly, brothers and sisters and my neighbors. We need to understand this. That when we sin, ultimately we are sinning against God. Look at verse 3. It says, I have sinned against you. Most people in our contemporary society would say, He sinned against Uriah. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against uh, his generals. And in fact, surely there are some things there that that he needed to restore. But ultimately... My friends, listen to me. Ultimately, when we sin, we are sinning against God. That's the bottom line. We are sinning against God. And so David says, God, be gracious to me. Verse 3, I have sinned against you. You and you alone have I sinned against. And then in verse 5, he says this. He reminds God. God. I was conceived in sin. Listen, everyone needs to look at me and listen to me. Every person viewing this today, you were born into sin. The fall of humanity, Adam and Eve and all of that has completely scarred you and I. And we will be scarred until Jesus comes back. But I'm here to tell you today that we have been, we have been conceived in sin. We are born into sin. We're not born with angel's wings. I see pictures of babies with angel's wings. That's hogwash. We are born into sin. We are a sinful people. And left to ourselves, we will destroy ourselves and destroy others. But God in the middle of this is gracious. Be gracious to me, God. I sinned against you because I was was conceived in sin. I was born into sin. But the last thing that I want to share with you today is in verse 7. Look at verse 7 here. It says this. 
I know, God, that you're able to make me whiter than snow. Praise God. I am here to declare to you today that I don't care what it is that you've done. If you'll call out to God, He will, by His grace and mercy, make you white as snow. What's that mean? That's imagery that means He will make it as if you had never sinned. And He will bring into your life the wonderful power of the Holy Spirit and it will change your life forever. Oh, I encourage you to get right with God today. I encourage you to confess your sins before the Lord today because God is able to come and cleanse you and make you as white as snow on the inside. Hey, that's the place that every person on the face of the earth needs to be. Praise God. You say, Pastor John, that's it? That's it. You mean I don't have to walk down the aisle of a church and say a sinner's prayer? No, you ain't got to do none of that. You just have to confess who you are as a sinner to God and ask Him to forgive you just like David did. And God will do that. He'll make you white as snow. Well, hey, let's all repent. Myself included. Let's get right with God. Let's confess our sins before the Lord. And I'm telling you what, we will live a better life. I'm convinced of it. Well, I love you in the Lord. I appreciate you so very, very much. Take time to read Psalm 51 today. It'll bless you. It really, really will. I love you in the Lord. I can't wait to see you again real soon. Parents, another reminder, today at 530, check out Pastor Josh and Miss Amanda. They'll be with your kids today. It's going to be a great time this afternoon. Hey, again, fam church, love you in the Lord. Take care of yourself. So long.